Um, welcome everybody. My name is Brittany LeBeau and I'm a professional advisor here in the Rubenstein School. I'm also the staff advisor for the Student Advisory Board and I'll have the rest of my team introduce themselves. Okay, I'll go next. I'm Julia. Um, I'm a Rubenstein steward um, and I'm just here to help out. <laughs> And probably gain some cool knowledge about grad school too. I mean, hey, that's oh, a perk. For sure, for sure. Yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm Ryan Buckley. I've probably seen a few of you before. Um, I'm a, a fellow uh, professional advisor with Brittany, um, who you know, shout out has done really awesome work with this, uh, and Julia also with the help you guys, the stewards SAB have been really fantastic at putting all this to, uh, together. Awesome. Uh, so welcome everyone. This is the grad school information session and student panel. We're going to start out with a nuts and bolts presentation from Professor Brittany Mosher, who will kind of walk us through what grad school is all about. And then the student panel will come afterwards. So Brittany, if you want to take it over, introduce yourself and get going. Sounds great. Yeah, thank you stewards and SAB and Brittany L for um, inviting me and for kicking off this program. I hope that folks find it useful. Um, talking about grad school is something that I find very exciting um, and I do quite a bit of it when folks come and check in with me during uh, office hours. Brittany, can you see my presentation? I can. Okay. So as Brittany mentioned, I'm an assistant professor here in the Rubenstein School. I teach in the Wildlife and Fisheries Biology program, um, and I'm going to give a little bit of a grad school overview today. Uh, I tried to balance getting into the nitty gritty because there are certainly lots of details that we could talk about. Uh, I opted slightly more for a bigger picture view, and you can ask some more detailed follow up questions in the Q&A um, with the panel. So what is graduate school? Let's begin there. Um, today I'll mainly be talking about the majors that we have in the Rubenstein School, so ha I'll have an ecological focus. And grad school is this umbrella term that captures a variety of different program types that you could enter um, post your undergraduate career. Typically these programs lead to some kind of degree and the ones we'll talk about today are a professional science master's degree, a master of science degree, or a doctor of philosophy degree, PhD. Just a note here that graduate school more generally in other fields might include programs that lead to medical degrees or business degrees or art degrees, uh, law degrees, etc. So grad school is this umbrella term. In ecology, we kind of have a few different tracks um, and those are the ones we'll talk in most detail about today. What qualifies me to talk about graduate school? A few things. I went to graduate school twice, in fact, um, once for a Master of Science and once for a PhD. Also, I currently mentor undergraduate students like those of you in Rubenstein who are interested in going to graduate school. And in fact, a lot of the things I'll be talking about in this presentation have come out of interactions I've had with you um, in our advising sessions. So I've kind of kept a running list of what these frequently asked questions are about graduate school. And those are the things that I'm trying to cover in today's session. Beyond folks in Rubenstein, I get a lot of emails from people outside of UVM who are interested in or sometimes confused about graduate school. So um, I think the fact that I'm in a position where I receive emails for grad school hopefuls can help me give you some advice on how you might be reaching out if you're interested um, in attending graduate school other places in the future. And finally, I work with graduate students. So my research lab focuses on conservation biology and amphibians and reptiles and disease ecology, and I hire and mentor graduate students. And so I also have a little bit of an idea of, um, you know, what the qualifications are that make someone a competitive candidate for a graduate position these days. 
So my disclaimer here is that I am best suited to talk to you about graduate education in ecology, since that is the focus of my research and sort of what we mostly do in Rubenstein. And so that is going to be the focus. And it also seemed like based on our panelists backgrounds that their focus is also research based degrees. So we might not be able to answer all the questions that you have um, if you're interested in some of these professional degrees that we'll talk about but uh, we can certainly connect you with the right folks to get those questions answered. Okay, I'm gonna go through this part quickly. Um, if you're in this session, you've probably already thought a little bit about why you might wish to go to graduate school, but it's a, it's a decision that uh, should, should take some time, right? So think about why you're feeling this call to graduate school, um, write down your answers and Maybe bring those to your next advising session so we can talk about whether it's a really good fit for you. So some of the reasons that folks um, come up with for why they want to attend graduate school are listed here. So perhaps you're really excited about learning more about things that you've gotten a little bit of exposure to as an undergraduate. And graduate school is a great place to dig deeper into some of those topics and to, to really become an expert in them. Uh, maybe you feel like given the complicated challenges that are facing the earth, you need more knowledge to be an active contributor um, to finding solutions to those, those challenges. Graduate school is a place where you can develop that expertise. Maybe you have a very particular career path in mind and you know already that to do thing X, I need to have a master's or I need to have a PhD. An example would be, um, if you want my job, <laughs> if you would like to be um, a professor at a university that teaches and does research, typically you need a PhD to do that. Um, perhaps there are other positions where you know you need a master's. In other cases, sort of along the same lines, maybe you think you could do it without a graduate degree, but you know you'd be more competitive um, if you did have a graduate degree. So you're seeing it as that next step um, to make you stand out in the job market. Maybe you've gotten a taste of research in some of your classes and you want to pursue that. You want to develop more hands-on research experience. You want to design studies and collect data and analyze data and kind of go through every step of, of the scientific method there. And then maybe you're interested more so in the, the professional skills that come with completing a graduate degree, like becoming more independent seeing projects through from start to finish, um, learning to communicate with a variety of different people. I think these are all you know, great reasons to go to graduate school and you might have other reasons as well. So these are the three loose types of programs we'll talk about today. Um, they are course or project-based graduate degrees and most of these are Master of Science or Professional Master of Science degrees. Uh, sorry, master science degrees. The next one is professional science degrees, and this is typically also in the master's category. And then the research based degrees, which I'll spend most of the time talking about, and this is where you have the master's and the PhD track. So before we go much further, let's just talk about the master's versus PhD, because that's a question that I often get. So why do you do one versus the other? Um, if you're going to do a PhD, do you do a master's first? This is a picture of a young Brittany M, myself, uh, as an undergraduate where I got to meet Bill Nye, the science guy. And I looked Bill up today. It turns out Bill doesn't have any graduate degrees. Um, Bill has a, a bachelor's of science degree in mechanical engineering. So this is just to say, again, back to the question of, do I need to go to graduate school? Absolutely, not everyone has to go to grad school. Um, you could be Bill Nye without going to grad school. Although I will note that Bill Nye now has six honorary PhDs from different institutions that they have awarded to him. So here are some of the key differences between the master's and the PhD. Uh, the, the first one that comes to mind is length. So the PhD is a longer endeavor. Often it falls within the four to six year range. Whereas a master of science is typically more in the two to three year range. An exception to that two to three years for a master's is the accelerated master's program. And I have a slide that briefly talks about that. That one's done in one year. The second piece, and maybe this is really um, the most important piece, is the difference in responsibility and creative license that you might have as a master's student versus a PhD student. So typically a PhD student is going to be responsible for more administrative work 
um, perhaps you're going to be doing, you know, hiring a field crews. You're going to have to submit protocols for university approval if you're handling animals, those sorts of things that if you're a master's student, we might buffer you a little more against. And then on the research side, typically for a master's, because it um, is such a short timeline, often the groundwork is really laid for you in advance and the objectives of the project are often set and you're coming in and you're tackling them. In a PhD, you might be responsible for developing more of those objectives yourself, coming up with the ideas for the project, even if a, a general sort of um, theme has already been determined. And then of course, uh, the careers you're qualified for may differ between the master's and the PhD. So that kind of gets back to the, you know, why do you want to go to graduate school? What kind of careers are you thinking about? I'll also point out that there are certainly careers that a PhD might overqualify you for. So it's, it's certainly something to consider about which degree is the best fit for you. And it's not that you just do one or the other, you can do both, as I have done both. Um, and in fact, some PhD programs or research groups will suggest or even require that to apply for a PhD position, you have to already have a master's. That's not true everywhere. Um, it's not true at UVM as a general policy, but with individual researchers that you might be interested in working with, they might have a lab policy about it. They might say, oh, we really don't take anyone on um, for a PhD because of the long time commitment, unless that someone already has sort of a track record of research um, and, and they know what they're getting into and that they're excited to kind of bite off that bigger chunk of a PhD. So all sorts of options here, but hopefully some of the differences in the two degrees help you decide what you might be interested in. And again, you can do both. OK, now back to these um, course or project based degrees. So many of these um, are popping up in recent years, and some of them actually are largely offered online, which can be super convenient, um, especially if you already have a job and you're kind of looking to slowly build up to completing your master's degree by doing part time work. The goal is to learn new skills and new content um, in areas that you're interested in growing in. And these programs, as their name implies, they focus on coursework, so they typically don't have a research component or a written thesis or dissertation. Another important point here is that typically these degrees um, are not funded, meaning you are not paid to complete the degree. You pay to attend um, the university and to complete the degree. So in that way, it's a little bit more um, like undergraduate and the application process is that way as well. A couple examples here that I just found on the web and through word of mouth. Here's the Master of Geographic Information Systems at Penn State University. So this is going to give you additional skills in GIS. And this last sentence here on the right says this online master's program allows for flexibility and customization. So you can do this, you know, over the period of however much time you want by knocking off a course here or there. Um, as another name for some of these course based degrees is Plan C. So this is the Plan C Masters in Fish, Wildlife and Conservation Biology at Colorado State University. And this one in particular says that this one is targeting natural resource professionals um, who are looking for additional skills. And so this one is also largely online. And so if you already are a full time employee somewhere, but you're looking for that next promotion, you might choose to do a program like these where you can add courses, develop that those skills, eventually have a credential. It's going to allow you to to get to the next level in your career path. OK, the next one I want to talk about is the professional science degrees. Um, these are a little less common, but they are popping up and I have had some um, undergrad students at Rubenstein that are interested in them. So this combines coursework and workplace specific skills um, to train students for non academic non research um, professions. Again, these don't typically have a research component. You don't do a thesis or dissertation. Similar to the course based degrees, they're not funded. You pay to attend. Here's an example. This is the professional science master's degree in zoo, aquarium and animal shelter management at Colorado State University. 
So in this particular program, if you already know you, you don't want to be a researcher, but you want to be involved with the business of zoos and aquaria and animal shelters, um, then this is going to combine some sort of animal handling and zoology and conservation training with probably things like business um, and, and the sort of nuts and bolts that you need to actually be in this industry, which is certainly different than, you know, research or academia. And I'll just do a quick student highlight here. This is Ben Rosen, who's a graduating senior this year and is one of my advisees. And I credit Ben for me learning about this program because Ben came to my office and said, I want to go to graduate school. And I started ranting on about research. And he's like, I don't want to do research. I have been working at Echo in downtown Burlington, and I want to, to have a job like that. And so we identified this program. And I'm happy to say Ben applied and was accepted. Um, and Ben was kind enough to send me this little bl blurb about why he was interested in this particular program. So he took an interest in, interest in this program because he did not feel like he was done with school, but he didn't want to go down the traditional route of academia that typically comes from these research-based grad programs. This program combines classroom time and real-world experience without requiring him to jump through a bunch of hoops that he will never really need. So he knew it was for him. Uh, and I'm sure Ben would be happy to talk to other folks. Um, ben has a minor in animal science and so has always had this kind of combined interest in conservation, but also animal care. OK, and then we we pivot to the research based degrees, and this is what we'll kind of spend the rest of the time talking about. So this is perhaps the most common type of grad program in the general field of ecology. And in these degrees, Students conduct research, they write up that research in the form of what we call a thesis if you're a master's student or a dissertation if you're a PhD student, and you also take some courses. And the great news here is that these are often funded positions, meaning that you are paid a stipend to um, attend the university and to do your research. However, the amount that you are paid or the amount of support in general can vary a lot from school to school. So it's absolutely something um, to look into. And an example of this is the master's program that we have here at UVM in the Rubenstein School. So we have a Master of Science in Natural Resources um, with different concentrations, including one in wildlife science. And in these degrees, you are learning how to be a researcher. So how does funding work? When I was an undergraduate and was learning about graduate school, I did not know that you might be paid to go to graduate school. And for me, as coming from a low income family, like that was amazing news and it meant that grad school was possible for me. And beyond just being paid, in some programs, you um, actually have your tuition covered as well and your health insurance covered. So these are the pieces, the stipend, the tuition, and the health insurance that as you're looking for positions, you kind of want to keep your eye out for. Some of them may include one of the three or two of the three or all three of the three. Um, and, and there's a lot of variability there. And there's certainly also variability in the amount of the stipend. Um, and there's also, of course, variability in, in the, the cost of living in different places. So those are all things you'll need to factor in um, when making these kinds of decisions. A brief note here, um, an exception to the you are paid for research based graduate degrees is the accelerated master's program that Rubenstein and many other universities offer, which really functions more as a fifth undergraduate year. And so typically that in that fifth year, um, you are not paid. It is you are you are usually getting some kind of tuition break and you are finishing a master's degree and an undergraduate degree in five years instead of starting a new master's program that might take you two to three. So there's a savings of time and there's usually a, a discount that comes with it, but typically not a stipend. So how does funding work? Some schools have a general application with an annual deadline that you can apply to. And once you apply, you become eligible for what's called a fellowship. And a fellowship just means that those pieces I talked about, the stipend, the tuition, 
um, the health insurance, they would be covered by the university if you're selected. So it's a competitive process. They'll select some number of folks to come to grad school and funding will be provided um, through their university. Probably more common is that schools encourage you to apply to positions that are posted and advertised. Very specific positions like Brittany Mosier is hiring a master's student to work on a turtle nesting conservation project. Um, and in those cases, the projects are also likely to be funded, but the source of the funds is not from the university, it's from a grant. So someone like me wrote a grant, wrote a budget, and if the grant is awarded and they send the funds, then in that budget, I hopefully budgeted for a graduate student to be supported in terms of their stipend, tuition, and health insurance. So these two streams, um, I wanted to point them out, and some schools do do both, um, just so that you know, some places where you might look for positions, you will see these funded positions that have pretty specific titles, and that's because someone wrote a grant with specific research objectives, and that was funded. And other, other schools you might be interested in, they might entertain general applications, and you sort of figure out the project later, um, but, you, but you submit a regular application to be considered. Funding. I get lots of questions on this TA versus RA business. So you have had TAs work as part of the classes that you have taken here. And teaching a TA just stands for teaching assistantship. RA stands for research assistantship, or sometimes we call it a graduate research assistantship, GRA. And these are just two different ways that students are paid their stipend. Um, so in a TA, for instance, at UVM, UVM is the one that's actually paying you, and they're paying you for the teaching that you're providing. In an RA, you are being paid by the, this research grant that I've mentioned, and that just means that your, your only focus is to do your research. So when you're covered by a TA, you have some teaching tasks and you're doing your research in addition. If you're on an RA, it means that you're funded just to focus on your research itself. And sometimes you might be funded by a mix of these things. So when you see advertisements posted, it might say, two years of GRA funding, or it might say one and a half years of GRA funding and one semester of TA funding. So it's good to just keep track of these things um, as, you're, as you're perusing and perhaps as you're getting interviews and that sort of thing. And I want to just point out that when you're TAing, you're doing two jobs, right? You're teaching and you're also trying to move your research project along. When you're an RA, you're focusing on your research. Another important thing to note is that TA funding typically doesn't cover the summer. So those are three months of the year that you might need some additional salary um, unless there's a summer course that you could teach. And then sometimes TA funding is less than RA funding, but not always. So this is basically to say um, if you are interested in teaching, then a position where, te where teaching is an option can be really um, a great experience. I had wonderful experiences being a teaching assistant when I was in grad school. However, I was really thankful that I only needed to do it for one semester um, because it takes a lot of time. And I was worried that I wouldn't be able to keep pushing my research along and graduate on time if I was teaching a lot more than I was. Okay, so how do you find positions? Um, I think I can work with Brittany to make sure folks can get the PDFs uh, of the slides here, but one great resource is the Texas A&M Natural Resources Job Board. And at the end of the session, if we have a minute, I'll just sh show you that. A second is this ecology, it's called the Ecolog Listserv. Um, you have to make a free account in order to be able to access that listserv, but you can do that with this link. Twitter is actually an amazing place to find these positions. So if you're on Twitter, follow me and uh, keep an eye out for positions that are posted there. And then you can also reach out to faculty directly. So, you know, I don't have any positions posted right now, but if you are really excited about the things going on in my lab, you could send me a personal email and we can talk a little bit about how, how to do that. Um, 
to understand what the chances are that I might be advertising a position soon or to see if I might have funding that I just haven't posted about and that I am really recruiting students. And this link here um, goes to my colleague Grace Dorenzo's webpage. She has this excellent section on grad school that has a bunch of articles and links um, that I highly recommend folks checking out. So should you reach out to faculty you might be interested in working with? Absolutely. But do not be disheartened if they write back saying, I'm sorry, we don't have any positions, or if they don't respond at all. Um, I always try to respond, but there are some weeks or months where I get way more um, inquiries than I can respond to. And, and as I'm describing here, like in my research lab, I really can't bring someone on as a graduate student unless I've just received a grant that will pay them. And so you could be the top candidate in the world and we could have a great connection and I could be so excited about working with you. But if I don't have funds in hand to pay you, then the timing is just not on our side for me to be able to extend an invitation for you to uh, apply. So don't be disheartened. It's really great practice to reach out and to be communicating with people about your research interests regardless. Maybe the question you have is more, how do I reach out? My suggestion is that you write a short email, the kind of email where if I open it, I don't want to run the other way. I, I say, OK, there's something here. I can read it quickly and I can ask more questions if I have them. So a short email that makes a solid case for why you're emailing me. You know, what's the connection? Why do do we have similar research interests? What are your research interests? And then in an attachment, you can include a much more detailed letter if you want to cover some more information and your resume. I always say it's like online dating. If any of you have been in the online dating world, sometimes you get messages from people and all they say is like, hey, you seem cool. And you just think to yourself, are they copy and pasting this just to like anyone they can find? And then maybe you get a message that says, hey, I notice you like X, Y, and Z. I also like those things. In fact, this weekend I was hiking here, you know, and, and you can tell like, wow, this person really engaged with my profile. <laughs> they thought about what characteristics I had and what they had and why it seemed like a good match. And that's, that's a story that you want to tell if you're emailing a faculty member, right? So you want to say, wow, I read your paper on blank. I thought it was really interesting that you found blank. I was thinking about blank. My research interests are in such and such and kind of, you know, make the story why it's a great connection, why this would be a, a great team and why um, the research interests match. And this is a, a Google Doc here that um, a research lab has posted on their website to share and it gives a really detailed like multi page breakdown of you making that ask to a faculty member and kind of coaches you through every step of the way and even gives a template email um, that you can use to help yourself kind of start to make the ask. OK. I have a couple slides of wrap up. This is advice you didn't ask for. I'm giving it anyway. I guess that's what today is all about. Um, the advice that I always give is that there are three elements that can make a grad program a super success and it's a slam dunk if you feel like you're able to check off all three and those are the advisor you'll work with the project that you'll complete and the location so the advisor the supervisor the the PI or principal investigator the faculty member whatever you want to call this person they are going to be your mentor and they are going to be the one that is guiding you teaching you new skills expanding your network helping you overcome research challenges and frustrations and disappointments um, and they're going to write reference letters for you right their network will become your network they're they're going to be the one that's introducing you around to folks at conferences and whatnot so um, do your homework and by that I mean if you happen to be offered a position do not say yes until you have asked to speak to current students that work with this person. I have had several situations myself where I talked to folks that worked with the person I wanted to work with and they told me to run far away and um, if I hadn't done that I might have found myself in a really challenging situation because if this person isn't on your side and if they don't take mentoring seriously 
it can make um, your graduate program much more challenging than it should be. We want it to be a positive experience. Also, just to note that my master's advisor uh, wrote me a reference letter when I applied for this position at UVM. So a decade later, this person was still willing to go to bat for me, and that's the kind of person that you want to work with. The next piece is the project. So this is a project that whether it's a, a master's or a PhD, it must keep you engaged and excited for two to five years. So this should be something that's gonna, that you're gonna be excited to work on, but perhaps more importantly, that you can see that the skills you're going to develop on this project are the skills that you think you need for that next step, the next, next step in the career journey. So, you know, I, I don't think people need to worry too much about like, well, this was on toads and I really wanted it to be on birds. Perhaps the bigger question is like, are the GIS skills that you're learning something that you're going to take with you? Um, is Are you working on a, a big team of folks and are those communication skills what you want to develop? So a lot of those things are what we call transferable, right? From one system to another. Think about those bigger skills and make sure you're excited about developing those things. And then finally is location. Um, so for programs that are not remote, that you would actually be moving to a uni uni new university, this is the place um, that you will be spending your time and the community that you will be joining. And I think it's totally important for people to take stock of what they need. Um, some people need skiing and would just not be happy in a place for two years where they could not ski. Some people need seasons. Some people need a thriving art scene or diversity or proximity to your family. Um, so if you know that those things are critical to you, then plan accordingly. If you happen to be someone that says, you know, I could live anywhere for two years and see it, you know, as an adventure, then that's also fantastic because that keeps a lot of options open for you. Um, but if you already know, like there are certain things that you need, then definitely work that into your search plan. The other advice I have is just to start looking at graduate projects early, like a year or more out. So look at these posted advertisements and look at the qualifications and see what people are looking for. See if you notice any trends like, boy, five positions in a row all said, um, we'd love it if this person used R. Because that gives you time to think about brainstorming ways to get a little additional coursework or, you know, some internship experience or any other experience. There's still time to kind of develop those new skills. Okay. I think we're about ready to go to the panel. Brittany, if there's time, I do want to maybe open just my web browser for a minute or two and show the Texas A&M job board. Does that work? Yeah, yeah, go okay. ahead. OK, great. Definitely. Yes, and I definitely want to shout out to all the students um, who have come to speak with me about grad school because they are really the reason that I thought this would be a useful presentation to kind of put those frequently asked questions together. OK, so what I'm going to do. Just bring up this natural resources job board. So if you just Google Texas A&M job board, um, you'll find this. And over here on the right hand side, we can filter the search and you might be interested in internships or seasonal positions coming up for the summer. Um, but right now we're talking about graduate assistantships. And so you can see that positions have been posted, you know, daily for the past many days. And some of them are PhD, some are masters, some might, they might be hiring multiple positions. And if you pick one to click on, let's pretend we want to go to Vancouver. <laughs> um, up here in the top, it'll give some information on the salary. So that's something important to look at. Again, definitely factor in where the position is. Some of these seem very low, um, but then you check out Craigslist in those places and you're like, oh, I can rent a place for, you know, 300 bucks. Um, and all of a sudden it's the, the funds make a little more sense. And so here's where I'm talking about um, if you check out this qualification section, 
And this is for a PhD. Um, they want this person to have a strong academic record, experience with amphibian husbandry and pathogen culture, and a record of publishing in peer reviewed journals. So this to me says like, we want this person to already have a master's degree, right? Those are some pretty detailed um, qualifications. Um, let's look at this one in Oklahoma. Okay, this one, 22,000 a year with benefits. So that probably means with health insurance. Um, they would prefer someone who has experience working in aquatic systems. Um, they'd love someone who has some experience with zooplankton or water quality or statistics. So that's that gives us a little more information. Let's look at one more. Woodpeckers at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, $20,000 a year. None of these so far have said anything about TAs. So that's kind of interesting too. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And then this is, uh, we've got required qualifications here. So you have to have a bachelor's. You have to be able to work independently and as a team. You have to be interested in developing advanced quantitative skills. But you're going to be an ideal candidate if you've used GIS and R. Uh, if you have experience collecting field data, including point count surveys for birds and vegetation surveys. And if you have some interest or experience in the Intermountain West ecosystem. So this is just a place you can start to look to get an idea for what these um, funded projects might look like with the frequency that they come up, that sort of thing. Um, and hopefully that gives you a place to start um, your search for, for higher education. Wow, that was incredible. I um, can agree with one of our participants who added in the chat that this has been this has been wildly helpful um thank you oh, so good. much for, for that um i definitely learned a lot more about grad school than i even thought i knew um going into this so thank you um so yeah now we will transition to the graduate student panel where we get to actually hear from some grad students about how they got to be where they are now. So if the grad students could turn on their cameras. Hi, everyone. I recognize some faces. Awesome. And I'm just going to pick someone at random to start the introduction train. If you could all just introduce yourselves, um, pronouns, where you're at, what type of grad program you're in. Um, we can start there and then start sort of a Q&A session. So um, how about Franny? Do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, hold on one second. OK. Um, hi, my name's Franny. Um, I am a second year master's student here at UVM. Um, I actually attended UVM as an undergraduate. And oh, I forgot to mention she, her pronouns. Um, I was a parks, recreation, and tourism student at UVM. Um, essentially, I started my program, um, my graduate program, only a year after graduating my undergraduate program. Um, and my advisor during my undergrad days um, was Pat Stokowski, and we got along really, really well. Um, and as an undergraduate, she essentially gave me a few um, small research projects um, that were funded and I really enjoyed them. Um, and she suggested that I look into applying for grad school. Um, and so I did. And um, some funding opened up at UVM. I decided I enjoyed my undergraduate experience in the Rubenstein School. I loved working with Pat and it made a lot of sense to stay here. Um, I also started grad school during the pandemic, so it kind of just made sense to stay in Burlington, stay with someone that I know that I enjoy working with. Um, and so that's sort of how I ended up here. Um, my research interests are primarily in recreation and tourism. Um, I'm doing a Facebook study that kind of analyzes how uh, managers interact with visitors in public lands um, at the state and federal level. And yeah, so I'm primarily a social science person. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't really know how long I'm supposed to go on for. Should I pick the next person to go? 
Yeah, it's really for however long you feel like you need to introduce yourself. So yeah, if you want to just pick someone else with their camera on, we can sure. continue for. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I'll pass it off to Jess. All right. Um, hey, I'm Jess Weichel. She, her pronouns. I'm a third year PhD student um, working with Tony D'Amato, looking at forest management and climate change adaptation, and I'm um, hoping to wrap up my PhD next winter. Um, so I went to undergrad for forestry, uh, UNH, and then didn't go straight to grad school. I was out of school for about six years. Um, I worked as a practicing forester, helping people manage their land, um, did a lot of other things. And then um, kind of during that time realized that I was interested in like teaching, um, potentially doing like working as an extension forester or something, um, any of which required a master's degree. Um, so started looking around for master's degrees actually found a number of people I talked to were like, what, you have a job, why would you want to come back to school? Um, but then eventually found some traction and um, actually um, went to do my master's at the Yale School of the Environment, which is an interesting place because they're primarily set up to do kind of that kind of the paid professional master's degrees that Brittany was talking about, like non-research focused, um, but they do have a small number of research students who they don't fund. Um, so I actually, paid for my research master's, um, which was worth it to me because of some other benefits of the program and because of my background. Um, and then worked there for a year um, teaching a class on writing forest management plans, which I could do because of my past work experience um, and also uh, ran land owner outreach programming. Um, but I kind of knew I wanted to do a PhD and um, was yeah, and I knew I wanted to do a PhD with Tony in particular, um, but was in this funded position for two years, so it was kind of taking my time um, about it. And then he posted a PhD opening, like totally off season. It was in like May, um, and I responded to it and talked to him. And so went from thinking I wasn't going to be in grad school again in May to starting in August. Um, so it was a, a pretty quick transition. Um, and yeah, once I finish up, well, before I finish my dissertation, starting in August, I will be starting a job here at UVM, um, managing the school forests and teaching. Um, and I've been able to kind of jump forward and do that faster, I think, because of all that work experience I had. Um, so I spent a lot of time feeling like I was like behind everyone. And now I've, now I've somehow like leapfrogged my cohort. So it's been kind of an interesting process and I think a little bit different than what most people have done, but it's worked out well for me. Um, I will hand it off to Lindsay. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Lindsay. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a second year PhD student uh, studying with Breck Bowden and uh, Mindy Morales. Uh, I went to undergrad at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I was doing engineering. Uh, that's molecular biology, environmental engineering, things like that, uh, working with cyanobacteria, things like that. And then I got interested in UVM because it's one of the only places besides living in Iowa where I can study algae and I can look at cyanobacterial blooms as well as diatoms and everything like that. So uh, currently my research looks at uh, changes in algal bloom uh, composition in both uh, Alaska and the Arctic ecosystems as well as in uh, Hubbard Brook uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, but mostly interested in doing a PhD because I really enjoyed teaching. I really want to become a professor and kind of go that route and enjoy the research aspects of things. Uh, I did take a year or two off between undergrad. I skipped my master's, so I'm directly a PhD student, and I was in the AmeriCorps for two years, so I also can answer any questions about that. Uh, from there, I'll pass it to Kevin. Hi, everybody. My name is Kevin. He, him pronouns. I actually went to undergrad at UVM, a wildlife and fisheries biology major. I graduated back in May 2020, and I just started graduate school down at Auburn University in Alabama in October. So I've been here roughly six months. Um, between UVM and Auburn, um, I worked as as wildlife technician on, the, on two research projects in two different states. 
And what really spurred my interest in pursuing graduate school was, was realizing I was ready, more or less. Um, having multiple experiences, working in field jobs, working in, for different people, as well as seeing the skills involved, I needed to become a graduate student. I just knew as my time was ready and that I'd be frustrated had I not pursued graduate, if I chose to not pursue graduate school. And to Brittany's point about paying attention to Texas A&M, that's an excellent job board, especially if you're interested in what I'm doing, wildlife, uh, getting a master's degree in wildlife management research. Um, by paying attention to that job board, I was able to figure out what skills are necessary and really attractive for advisors. Um, and with that, I focused on skills like R, GIS, and various field skills like rail telemetry um, to really boost my resume when I went to apply. Like, for example, I did not know my advisor before starting this. Um, I just applied to a job and I happened to be the, the person who was selected for it. So if there's any piece of advice, keep your options open and pay attention to what those job, those postings are looking for and use your time in other positions to really increase those that skill set and mold your resume to what you're looking to do. And really don't keep your options, uh, pardon me, keep your options open. Um, don't ever try to not pigeonhole yourself and just be optimistic. Five years ago, I, if you told me I'd be living in Alabama, would not have believed you, <laughs> period. Um, I'm half an hour from the nearest grocery store and would not have guessed it five years ago. So just keep your options open. I think that leaves Jolian. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me to speak to you all. Uh, I'm Jolian. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a fourth year PhD student at Rubenstein, uh, where I study natural resources. My particular focus is on the governance of those uh, social and environmental resource systems, though. Uh, so I'm probably the, the least natural resource students uh, that actually is at Rubenstein. But uh, I really enjoyed it there. Uh, this is my second graduate program. I uh, went from Hendricks College, a small liberal arts school in Arkansas, to Indiana University, a massive state school in, uh, obviously, Indiana, uh, to UVM, a much more medium-sized institution uh, for my PhD. Um, and so I've got kind of a little bit of experience with a variety of different size schools. Uh, my particular focus, like I said, is on governance. My master's is in public affairs, uh, and I studied uh, political science at the undergrad level. So uh, that's kind of who I am, and I'll cap it off at that. Oh, I'm... Uh, oh, do we have another yeah, person? I'm yep, so sorry. sorry. <laughs> I didn't uh, know what that was. Uh, my name Julia, is Sophie, Julia. Um, and I am a graduate student at the University of Vermont. Um, I did my undergrad at UVM as well. Um, sorry if my connection is a little poor about that. Um, so I studied wildlife and fisheries biology as an undergraduate, um, but definitely gravitated towards the kind of soil science forestry aspect of it. Um, and with that, I ended up speaking with my current advisor shortly before I graduated, um, Tony D'Amato, and things kind of just fell into place that my current interest really aligned with something that was going on in his lab. Um, I'd worked for his lab for the previous two summers, um, so he hired me on. So it all was kind of just as Brittany was saying earlier, just by the luck of the draw that timing worked out for that. Um, my study is based um, in southern Vermont. I'm looking at soil organic carbon stocks in a northern hardwood forest, um, and I'm investigating how different canopy tree species um, can affect the soil carbon stored there. Okay, great. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and reintroduce myself super quickly because I don't think everybody was here when I did that at the beginning. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm a sophomore um, at UVM. I'm a Rubenstein steward, so um, I'm helping facilitate the panel today. Um, and so now we're going to start our Q&A session. We're going to do it like popcorn style. So anytime I ask a question, anybody can just feel free to buzz in and say whatever you would like to say. 
um, and participants, like audience members, I mean, um, are welcome to raise their hands um, and ask a question that way or just pop them in the chat. Um, but I have a question myself before we start. So um, I would just like to know what types of ways can I prepare as an undergrad if I want to go to grad school? Yeah, I, you're I feel go. free to unmute and just <laughs> go for for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, while I was at UVM, there is a Moose project going on in, or pardon me, under uh, Jed Murdoch and Terry Donovan. And so honestly, I just spoke with, um, I know them as the Moose guys, and see what, the, what those ma those two master student, students and PhD student did day to day, and what skills they typically use, what skills really weren't important, um, just to figure out what qualifications and background would be helpful moving forward if I wanted to pursue, and I did, and I am pursuing a project similar to their own, um, because what's fortunate about UVM and other colleges or universities rather, is that there's a lot of people, um, quote, living and working in Rubenstein, and there's a lot of different experiences happening under that roof. Um, and all you have to do is go ask, go talk to people. You can either speak to folks like Jed, or I'm sure Tony, um, or their students. I mean. Okay, I'm not there, but you guys are. Um, I mean, from my experience talking to grad students and shoot, I'm one, whether it be at UVM or another university, most of the times they're more than willing to talk to you about their research, how they got there, and what skills they use and don't use, and how you can then figure out where to focus your effort. Um, like, for example, if you talk to folks like in my, again, speaking from wildlife background, um, like Terry Donovan, for example, she can point you in good directions of re free resources that can help you build your resume or special projects that you can part volunteer on if for a couple hours a week um, to help boost your resume, gain new skills and meet new people. A lot of this field, again, through the wildlife field, is not a lot of it is who you know and what kind of reputation you build for yourself just as a person and as a uh, worker and researcher and so just get just saying hi and introducing yourself and asking a couple questions can really get the ball rolling something i could add on to that is that coming out of undergrad and going very quickly into grad school i had a very clear idea of what i wanted to do because i'd done a lot of volunteer work and interning in my undergrad um, but I know there are plenty of people that I graduated with that maybe, you know, hadn't gotten quite the same experience I had and didn't know specifically what they were interested in. So they needed to take some time to kind of build those skills and get a little experience learning what they actually liked. Um, because you are going to spend a couple of years of your life studying it and you want it to be something that you are actually passionate about. I think another thing to add would be if you see job postings either on the UVM job board or if you hear through word of mouth that certain professors that you enjoy um, going to their lectures, I think it's a good idea to take on TA positions as an undergrad if they um, come your way or if you know of professors that are actively looking for undergrad TAs. Because I know at least in my experience, I've had to TA my entire grad school uh, career thus far. And my experience as an undergrad TA definitely really helped prepare me for being a graduate TA. Cool, um, thank you for those answers. Very helpful. Um, so we have a question from Reed, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but uh, uh, have any of you guys been in an accelerated master's program? If so, what was that experience like? Um, I guess if n any nobody has been in one, if you guys know anything about an accelerated master's program at all? I can speak on that. Well, in a very different way that I was in an accelerated master's program for business in undergrad, um, was doing it. And it was, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of staying on top of your classwork and getting involved and making sure that you can transition between masters. 
and um, your undergrad work, but also be aware that example of what happened to me is that you might be your third year into your undergrad and you might realize, wow, I really hate business and I really don't want to do a master's in business. And so just make sure that that's what you're passionate about when doing an accelerated program. And I mean, read if you have more information you want. I can speak further on that at another point too. So, but that's also different at different schools that you go to. I am an accelerated bachelor student at UVM, so I can speak more directly to the whole natural resources side of it a little bit. Um, but yeah, as she was saying, it's very condensed in a way, and so you kind of have to plan ahead everything very well with your advisor um, to kind of, what's worked for me is to set deadlines for things ahead of time, just, just so that, you know, if you're just doing research and you're going along, it can get very easy to get behind. And when you're on a much more tight schedule, you want to make sure that you're still meeting those requirements. Um, so that's something that I found to be very important, um, but it's definitely doable. Okay, thank you. I don't know much about accelerated master's program. That sounds like a lot, <laughs> uh, but I, okay, I'm not seeing any new questions in the chat right now. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask another one of my questions. Um, how much experience does a graduate degree typically substitute for? Um, I would say it depends a lot on what field you're in and what you're trying to do. Um, you know, with forestry, um, a lot of times there'll be like a, a, like a, you know, if you have a master's degree, you need two years less experience for some jobs where it's just like a straight transfer. But there are also, I mean, there are some jobs that now you can't get without a master's degree. So there isn't like a year substitute necessarily. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really, that's almost another one where you'd have to kind of look at job postings for like jobs you're interested in, in the future and see. Um, because I think, yeah, I mean, hopefully other people can speak about, about other fields, but there's just, I think, a lot of variation in what employers want and what they feel a master's degree actually accounts for or not. Very cool. Um, thank you. Um, Brittany is typing. I don't know if I should let her finish typing before I ask another question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask another question. Um, <laughs> sorry, Brittany, if that's not what you want me to do. Um, so, Jess, earlier you mentioned something about um, applying on the off season. What is the off season versus the on season? So, um, you know, most positions like like college, they start either in the fall semester or sometimes with like a summer of field work beforehand. So it's pretty common to apply to master's and PhD programs like in the late fall and find out if you got in in the early spring. That, that isn't like a hard and fast rule. Like they do come up other times. But, um, you know, commonly like schools have application deadlines that aren't as hard and fast as they are for undergraduate, but still exist. Um, and there are also like funding cycles when when professors get grants, those tend to come out like, you know, big grants get announced at the same time each year. So it's pretty common to like kind of start these things in the fall, the applications and find out in the spring. Although, yeah, um, so it's less common to say sometime in the spring, especially late spring, find out about a position for the coming fall. And it's like too early to find out about a position for the year after that because nobody has funding yet. Um, so it kind of means that when, if, you know, if you're applying to a master's degree, you might find a few opportunities and apply to them all in the fall. And then in the spring, you find out which ones you get and you pick one. So, um, also it means that, you know, if you have a student who's like really planning ahead and you're a professor, uh, that motivated student might get like snatched up into a master's program in March. And then if you have funding available in May, you might maybe not get as the same caliber student you were looking for, although that's 
that's hard to judge. But yeah, a lot of it just has to do with when the funding comes out and, and when school starts. Um, but yeah, I would say like if you're looking for opportunities, look anytime. But if you're yeah, if you're trying to think about like applying for next year for you know 2023, you'd probably want to at least start thinking about it in the fall and making some moves before like the spring before you would want to start school. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Just kind of looking all the time. <laughs> Uh, Brittany has a question. Yeah, go for it. Hi, guys. Um, I'm just curious. So once you get your degree in whatever level and wherever you guys are at right now, what are you hoping to do next? What's next for all of you? Uh, I can jump in here, I guess. Uh, so this is uh, something that varies a lot degree to degree. Uh, some master's programs are designed to uh, really incorporate in, you into a particular professional community. Um, it, For example, with my initial master's program in public affairs, it's uh, almost more like a, a policy practitioner's type degree. You see a lot of people who go to work in government, uh, who go to work in think tanks, in consultancy firms, uh, for, um, you know, private companies advising on uh, various regulatory uh, situations that arise. So you see actually a lot of uh, variation with uh, that particular degree. But then now that I've stepped into a PhD, that kind of shifts a little bit. So often it opens up more avenues for teaching at a university, for example. Um, it may open up also more uh, higher levels of professional involvement as well. There are some positions that uh, prefer you to have a, a PhD research background. Um, it's a little bit less common perhaps to see PhDs in the government, although I'll admit for myself, I don't want to write off the, uh, the opportunity to, to do that as well. The public affairs background still uh, uh, rings pretty true within my own interests. And I think that that kind of also stems back to my broader philosophy of education in that I don't necessarily see that the only opportunity to educate exists within the university. I think that there are a lot of opportunities to apply uh, that sort of philosophy of an opportunity to educate beyond whether that's in interacting with policymakers, whether that's uh, making advice uh, to um, companies. And so I think for me, you know, I, I am trying to keep a fairly open door. I, I would I like to teach, um, but, uh, you know, it's a pretty tight field. There's a, a great deal of scarcity for tenure track positions. Um, and so perhaps, you know, that that broad view is also just a functional, uh, you know, survival instinct, if you will. Um, but I think the opportunity is there to really do a broad set of things. But really, in terms of what you open up with a Ph.D., often it is that track to potentially teaching at a university. Kind of. Uh, oh, no, Lindsay, you totally go for it. Go for it. OK. Um. So one nice thing I will say about um, PhD positions, and I believe masters, I don't want to speak for masters, is that you can either choose to do an internship during your time uh, working at UVM, or you can choose to do a teaching fellowship to complete part of your graduate studies. So, for example, like I mentioned before that I really like teaching, I want to probably go be a professor at a university or go to the nonprofit sector. So I am going to end up teaching part of a limnology course while I'm at UVM. And so you can take a course in how to teach and there's like graduate teaching practicums. And then you end up actually having that opportunity. Whereas the other option is like you can go do an internship at the DEC or like a fellowship and work in that sector. So you get more in-field experience, like if you want to go into government.
Um, this is kind of a follow up question to that one. Do you feel like your program has prepared you well for what you would like to do post grad school? Well, kind of talking to what Lindsay was just saying, often there are programmatic requirements that are beyond just what you're supposed to be educated on the topic material specifically, but also on the you know technical, how to deliver uh, in the classroom. I know I had to take a, a university teaching class as a part of my PhD program at Rubenstein. Uh, and I actually, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we went into uh, even kind of the, uh, neuroscience behind learning and how uh, different states of mind can deeply impact people's ability to learn. It's really fascinating. And at the same time, that's not necessarily the case at every university. Um, and so if you are looking for grad school programs and you want to have some more of that technical training, uh, look for that within the curriculum of the program because that does vary a little bit school to school. And it's not always assumed that, uh, you know, for example, if you're going to become a content expert with a PhD, uh, that you need to have additional education in how to be a good teacher or a good educator. Um, but I found it, you know, tremendously helpful and interesting. And so that, that would be something I'd recommend is take a good look at the program curriculum and see what sort of technical uh, uh, training is available as well. Just a quick add on, make sure that there's like money either in your grant or in through the school to attend different like uh, conferences, symposiums that you're interested in, because that's extremely important in, in your development when you're doing your thesis. I can hop on and answer Brittany's question from a few minutes ago. So. I think I've mentioned before, but I'm getting a master's degree in wildlife management or they Auburn calls it wildlife sciences, same thing. Um, I hope to go and become a state agency biologist. I happen to do my master's degree on wild turkey ecology. I hope to become a wild turkey biologist or something similar, such as like rough grouse or um, Bob White. And so, and to then add on to Julia's point, yeah, I think this program is helping me get to that point um, in becoming a biologist, which is a career level position at most state agencies, actually all state agencies for, pardon me, by agency, I mean Fish and Wildlife Agency for Vermont, okay, Vermont Fish and Wildlife for New York State, it'd be the New York State DEC. Um, everyone calls them a little bit different. They're all quickly known as a Fish and Wildlife Agency. Anyways, um, without graduate school, getting to that position, that career stage, I don't want to say impossible, but close to. Um, and so that's a main reason why I'm pursuing, well, not pursuing, I'm in graduate school to get at that position, to get at that level and to basically get to the next st stage in my career path. Um, like I said, without graduate school, I don't think that would have really been a realistic option. Um, and with without it, I would not have gained the skills and experiences necessary to then become uh, an an expert in a, a species or a suite of species that be w under a stand, uh, normal um, agency biologist purview. To sort of echo what Kevin said, um, I am also sort of, in, in, or what I'm trying to say is, I think in order for me to progress my career path, I think a master's degree isn't completely necessary. Um, I'm interested in public lands management, specifically um, focusing on um, visitor interactions with the land. Um, and in order to work for the Park Service, Forest Service, or even a land trust, I think I would need a little bit more education than my Parks, Recreation, and Tourism degree provided me with. Um, so doing this master's degree was kind of the next logical step. Um, my super long-term goal after hopefully getting a job at some sort of land managing agency would be to go back to school and get a PhD. Um, I think kind of my true passion would be environmental education and teaching, but I'm still young and I don't know if I'm quite ready to launch into a full PhD program.
something else I could add that kind of ties into all of that a little bit. I'm also doing a graduate degree, not only because I'm interested in the topic, but because I think it will help me get to where I want to be um, career wise. But something that I think I overlooked at the beginning was the fact that not only are you getting the education and all of that, but with my degree, I get a lot of experience leading this project um, and developing my skills further that you might have gotten experience in GIS or R in undergrad, but it was, you know, applying them to some project that was pre-structured. And so taking all of those skills and reapplying them in your own setting, um, that really grows you in a very different way than you would get in an undergraduate degree. So when you're applying for jobs, it's not just the fact that you have this degree and have all of this knowledge, um, but it's that you've really learned to apply skills and learned how to learn how to apply skills, I think is very important. Those are great answers. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I am going to hand it over to Brittany for a moment before we wrap up, but thank you so much again for being here. I have learned so much personally and I'm now rethinking some things. Ah, okay. Go for it, Brittany. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Julia, and thank you all of you for uh, sharing tips, tricks, your experiences. It's been awesome hearing all of your different pathways and stories, and um, I definitely am thinking some things too. Um, you are convincing me to go back to grad school. Congrats. Um, I have one last question to kind of wrap up the evening, um, and this is for current undergraduate students. So. Uh, again, you you all shared tips and tricks and Brittany did a great job presenting lots of advice and tips and tricks um, about grad school. But if there's one thing that you want to say to undergrads right now who might be considering grad school, but not entirely sure, what would that one thing be? One piece of advice that I always provide to those that are looking to do grad school is that you need a solid set of recommenders. Uh, I can't stress this enough because of the longevity of cultivating the relationship to get a good recommendation is really something that you can't necessarily start your senior year, and it might even be kind of difficult to start your junior year as well. Most uh, grad school programs will want to have at least three recommendations to help you uh, get accepted and the thing is that most people that go to grad school probably have pretty good grades probably have pretty good test scores probably took very similar classes to you and often what can set you apart from another candidate is having three recommenders who really step up to the plate and write you a strong recommendation you got to start making those relationships as early as you can most faculty members want to have had multiple classes with you or have had you as a TA or have done research with you at the undergraduate level and that all that that all that stuff takes time to do uh, to to grow and to foster and so start forming those relationships as soon as you can and uh, just start planning for it start thinking about okay who which professors am I going to end up taking multiple classes with which professors classes have I done pretty well in? Uh, did I make a connection with them? You know, did I make sure to put my hand up a lot and comment? Uh, all those sorts of things. They're very personal, but often they're what sets you apart from everyone else. So make sure that you're cultivating those relationships and getting good recommendations from people who know you uh, and are willing to step up to the plate for you. Um, um, my piece of advice is just kind of don't worry about uh, sticking to a particular schedule. Like if you want to go right after undergrad, that's great. If you want to take one or two or three years off, also great. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of people who are like, oh, I have to do this right now. Or like, I'll be old when I start it. Or like, I, um, I'll forget things. And, um, just because it's something you want to do, it doesn't mean you have to do it right now. Um, and it doesn't like the door to graduate school doesn't close really ever. Um, so like if, if you have hesitations or want to get work experience first or want to get research experience first, like don't feel like there's some timeline you have to follow or some rule book you have to follow. Just, um, you know, build build the connections like Julianne said, but 
find find a path and timeline that works for you and don't feel like it's the wrong one just because it's not what people around you are doing. Just building off that too, don't settle for a graduate program that you don't necessarily think you fit into. If it means waiting a year and being with someone who you know is going to be a better advisor for you, that's the option you should take. To add to that, um, my advisor has pretty much made my graduate um, school experience for me. Without her, I would be entirely lost, and I owe so much of kind of everything that I do in Rubenstein to her. And so I would say, similar to what Lindsay said, make sure, I mean, it's, I know it's hard to tell when you're applying to graduate programs if you'll mesh with this person, but I would say if you have a strong gut feeling one way or another about someone, definitely trust it. As other people have said, talk to their previous grad students. Um, your advisor should be someone that doesn't make your life miserable. It should be someone that you can trust and go to for advice. And so I think making a really positive, strong connection with your advisor is really important. Yeah, to echo everyone's saying, there is no rush. Grad school isn't going anywhere. You might see a project pop up and they advertise a graduate position you're really interested in, and you may not get it or you may not choose to apply. Okay, that's fine. There'll be another cool one in a year. It's not, a, it may seem like the end of the world at the time, at the time, in the long arc of your career, it, it just doesn't matter, in my opinion. Um, I waited a year before going back to school. I work with, I work with their other graduate students I work with who waited eight years. Another person I work closely with went directly into graduate school. It just all depends on you. And honestly, my piece of advice is get out there and work first. Um, what I've seen is that everyone I'm around is really interested and passionate about what they do because they've had the opportunity to work on different projects. Again, I'm speaking from wildlife perspective and same thing we said for fisheries perspective of figuring out like, okay, this aspect of the project I'm really interested in or passionate about this side of thing because I'm not as a technician level or in, the te in their technician positions. And so they can figure out like, okay, I would rather pursue this for graduate school versus that. And I mean, in, in my opinion, nothing can be worse than getting to a graduate position and realize like, shoot, this is not what I envisioned or like not how I want to spend my time. And seeing someone pull out of graduate school, it, it's happened once since I've been here. Um, it that's just it's really disappointing because like Brittany said, these positions are not high paying. Um, they're just not. And so to have the uh, having waste having had or pardon me, having wasted your time would feel terrible. And so going out into the world, work working, seeing talking to different people, whether that be in Ruben while you're in school or at post graduation in a job or two or three. Um, and really getting a broader perspective, I think, is invaluable and just really having a clear goal and clear mission before you even apply to school and really figure out, like, if your advisor is who they who is somebody you want to work with and really work for for a number of years, because it's not a small decision. Um, like I said, I never thought I'd be in the state I am five years ago and it couldn't be happier here in my position. So I feel like for me, it was the right decision given all those factors and really there's no Again, it may seem like the end of the world trying to get into graduate school immediately after undergrad, but really it just it's fine. The short answer, it's fine to wait. So I think I can kind of tie up with that is also in addition to, you know, going out and working and getting a lot of experience. It's really great to be able to build connections with people who are in professions that you might want to be in. Um, just getting those connections uh, not only for references, but also for uh, like professional references if you are applying um, or if you need help later on in your career. Um, just knowing people that you could reference to for both help or future recommendations or whatnot, I think is very useful and something that I definitely tried to push for earlier before grad school. Awesome. Thank you guys. Those are really good answers. Um, I think that's it for now. That was a really great way to end our evening together, but I want to say thank you so, so much to all of you for taking your time to talk with us and to share your experience with students. 
Um, I know that they appreciate it and I have tons of emails flooding my inbox actively and throughout this whole session saying I can't make it, but is it recorded? Is it going to be recorded? So um, there's there's a lot of students who will really appreciate this evening. Um, so thank you and thank you again to Brittany Mosher for uh, that awesome presentation. Um, yeah, if there's anything else anyone wants to say before we sign off, then feel free to unmute yourself. But uh, thank you for an awesome evening. Thanks for organizing us, Brittany. All right. Okay.